you so far. It is my great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Dr. Andrew Reed, who is a professor of biology and entomology, uh, as well as an Everly College of Sciences distinguished senior scholar. Uh, he is also the director for the Center of Infectious Disease Dynamics, uh, and he's going to be talking about the unlearning of science education and his experiences with uh, Science 200. Uh, I've actually had the, the pleasure of working with Andrew on this course, and I think it's going to be a really interesting presentation for all of you. So, without further ado, Dr. Andrew Reed. Thanks, Chris. Almost everything you see on the technical front of it is Chris's responsibility. Um, so how many, I don't recognize any faces, how many scientists have I got here, by which I mean people with PhDs with some discipline you might recognize as a science of some sort, just two. Okay, you guys keep your hands down. Who can name me a living scientist? Far away, just check some names at me. Um, Donald Lewis. Okay. Um, Michu Kaku. Uh-huh. Davis, I don't know his first name. Okay. Okay, so the people that haven't mentioned anything, can you not think of a living scientist? Or is there just one there and you're being shy? Myself. Thank you very much. So I, <laughs> I find it slightly startling that people at Penn State don't have a string of Penn State names reeling off their, um, off their list. And when I got up to talk to my students, I introduced myself as a guy who was running a research program on malaria, controlling hundreds of, uh, not hundreds, I wish, millions of dollars of NIH money, working a research program with 15 different people on several continents, and not one of them named me as a scientist. In fact, not one of them named any living scientist other than close relatives. So my students didn't know any living scientists by reputation, not Stephen Hawking, not Francis Collins who runs the NIH, not Craig Venter who's inventing, making bacteria, nobody. Not James Watson who found DNA, nobody. When I asked them for the names of dead scientists, there was a couple of suggestions. Okay? And you can imagine that uh, Einstein and Newton aren't known to most people. Okay? Ask them to name a bunch of movie stars, or religious leaders, or politicians, or authors. No problems. No scientists. These students had no contact, no conception of science. And that was precisely the sort of student we were trying to reach. So the history of this course is that the Dean of Science has an advisory group whose argument was that uh, Penn State is doing a good job on tra training the science scientists of the future, and I think that's true. We do turn out very good physicists and good biologists and so forth. But we do a pretty lousy job of teaching uh, science to the non-science elements of the university, which is, of course, most students. So most students come to Penn State to do something other than science, I don't understand why that is. Why would you do anything other than science? Um, and if any of you've got any enlightening answers, do tell me. So we've got this massive disconnect between uh, what's going on in the classes the majority of students receiving and science, which if you think about it is actually going to be uh, possibly the cause, but certainly part of, the, part of the solution to almost every major problem we have for this century. And so we're really serious about producing the leaders of the future, the business leaders, the community leaders, um, the academics and so forth, people need to understand how science actually works. So the philosophy of the course was to try and make non-major, science non-majors, better consumers of science. Okay, so I got the job of trying to do this, and it's a bit of a challenge because we've got a three credit course, 200 level, open to anybody, so that's 37 and a half hours of contact time, possibly the only science that they will do at the university, maybe one or two other gen ed courses. And you've got to try and hook them in and keep them interested. And that was a bit of a challenge to me in way of thinking about it. I want to give you just a very quick illustration of how I did that because the details don't matter too much. Um, this is, uh, sorry, it's a bit small. This is Barry Marshall, who's a Nobel Prize winner from 2005 uh, ish, four ish. Maybe I've got the year wrong. Anyway, that's his Nobel Prize. Um, and he came into the class and talked about how to get a Nobel Prize. That was one of the best <laughs> class sessions we had. And afterwards, the really groupy students gathered around to hold the medal. And <laughs> those of you who have met Barry will know he's a real character. And I think his medal is continuously in his pocket. <laughs> and actually, to be fair, that's where I keep mine too. Um, so what I did to, to do in terms of classroom material, I decided that the students do not need to know any facts. The problem with science is that uh, we all get hung up, we scientists get hung up on the facts, the stuff, 
Okay, and in fact, the stuff that you learned as school kids, certainly that I learned as an undergraduate scientist, most of that stuff isn't actually terribly useful unless you're going to be a scientist. And a lot of the stuff that's really important for this century and our existence as humans wasn't being taught when I was an undergraduate. So, for example, stem cells. <laughs> the whole of immunology was two lectures in a biochemistry class. Uh, climate change, nobody was talking about that. In fact, we were talking about you know, running out of resources and things chilling down at that point. So the stuff of science doesn't matter at all. What matters is that you understand uh, the process is generating scientists to say things and the things you should be sceptical about and the things that you should accept. And so what I did was to teach us a series of narratives and this is the, um, the sorts of questions that I, I posed to the students and we discussed and went through that. So for example, well maybe I'll skip the examples. Then I got some outsiders in um, to talk about various topics, the Penn State experts uh, and Barry Marshall who's a visiting um, visiting Nobel Prize winner. Um, so we went through this sort of stuff in class. So one of my aims here was to get the students hooked in because I think some of these problems are interesting so you can sell them in advance and enough to keep them going through the semester wondering what he means by our mates toxic. So shamelessly pandering to things I think are probably interesting, not because I think these top, well some of these are interesting, but what was going on behind the scenes that the students didn't notice was all the stuff that I do think you need to know if you want to be a better consumer of science. Um, let me just give you a two second example of that. This is a paper from the British Medical Journal, which is one of the world's leading medical journals. And this was published in 2001, and this is the question of whether or not prayer improves health outcomes in hospitals. And this guy, uh, Leonard whatever, um, actually went one stage further and asked whether retrospective prayer improves health outcomes. So in other words, he took a bunch of patients from a hospital in Israel, I believe, and randomly allocated the patients to groups, and then 10 years later, got half of them prayed for. Okay? And then he looked at the health outcomes of the prayed for group. And his question was, would the prayer improve the health outcomes of what actually happened 10 years earlier? And that's a hell of a hypothesis, right? He's actually <laughs> arguing, not only is there a causal connection that prayer can improve health, but that because God can work in many mysterious ways, there's no question he could work backwards if he wanted to. Okay? This is a very serious paper, and the answer was it improved health outcomes. Okay? The prayed for group, prayed for 10 years after they left the hospital, left the hospital earlier than the non-prayed for group. And I have no reason to think there's anything wrong with the science at all. So there's a bunch of hooks for the students, right? I've got a bunch of things. You're all paying attention. How can that be? What's going on there, right? And one of the students after this class came up to him and said, that was a really wild class. Okay, in the process, I should say, there's an answer now. Um, a lot of these studies have been done and they've been pulled together in very rigorous uh, formal analysis. This is it. And the answer is that prayer does not help. It's not a very cheap health intervention. It doesn't work. So that particular study was one study which showed one result. There's been a bunch of studies that showed other words. So that is, this is the slide I showed at the end of the prayer classes of the stuff I'd actually gone through. Because so that's how I did the whole thing, right? That sort of, um, of narrative. So the students don't really notice what's going on, I hope. Right. The technology was something that we were um, very interested in uh, moving forward with. And I had the great fortune to bump into people who bumped into people who put me in touch with uh, Chris and colleagues. And so I did a couple of things which um, I thought would just entertain the students and turned out to be a lot more useful than just that. So one of them was to use Poll Everywhere. Fortunately, I didn't get advised to use the... It's the great thing about starting a course from scratch, especially when you're new to Penn State, is you don't have any of the problems of the baggage that comes with history. So I didn't have to use clickers. And I could go straight into new technology. And I don't know how many people have seen Poll Everywhere. Is there a substantial proportion of you that haven't seen Poll Everywhere, or do you all know what this is? So it's just a couple of you that are. So I'll just say quickly, so this is what you put up in the class. And... Um, uh, sorry, it's not just starting. Here we go, start. So this is one of the Clark questions that I got the dean in to teach. And he put these questions up. It takes two seconds to set the slide up. And then the students can do the texting or the tweeting or the online stuff. And they, if you're using a text, for example, text, the phone number is 37607. And then um, the student, the text message itself will be whichever answer they want. 
This is extraordinarily fast. Every student's got a, t a phone. It's bang, 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 and these, these bars move very quickly in real time. And since I've just started that, if somebody wanted to actually use it, they could. So the cell phone number is 37607, and the answer you want to give is one of these. Now, the dean used this as an example of uh, trying to motivate his talk. Right? What, how big is the universe? And that is a really cunning way of doing it. Okay? Now, I, I, mean, I was amazed that most of the students thought that the universe was infinitely big. Right? And uh, there was uh, somebody who thought it was tiny, and then this is the oops, the 19% is the correct answer. So the majority of the students had no idea how big the universe was. And the dean used that as a way of bouncing off for the rest of his session. How do we know that it's 100 billion trillion miles? What sort of information do you use on that? This is a sort of equivalent, I think, to the clicker technology. More interesting to me was that it's also got the option for having um, uh, running words coming in. So students can text you as a teacher. And what that means is that they can teach in real time. And so this is one of the sessions where they're coming through. Um, this is just replaying what happened in the classroom that day. So some of it you can see is junk. So here's M and N coming in and you know, somebody's struggling to get the numbering right. But here's the question, the thalidomide question. I'm talking about thalidomide in real time, and they are sending me text messages. Now, obviously, they can put their hands up, and I'm delighted to speak to someone putting their hand up, but a lot of students are too nervous to do that. And so, especially with outside speakers, they were really nervous. So they would text in, and I would have it sitting on my screen, not normally rolling like this, normally just visible for me, and a question would pop up, and if it helped the class, or I found it useful for teaching, I would use it. The other thing is that um, I would leave it running like this at the start of class for the first 10 minutes while they were getting organized and coming in late and doing all that sort of stuff that students do. So they'd text each other through the system. And that meant there was class dialogue going on in real time beforehand. And that had the immense merit that somebody would say, that test was really hard. Somebody else would say, no, it wasn't. And they'd have that sort of discussion, which helped manage a lot of class expectations. So that was really good. And I also found it extraordinarily useful from the question of, the students understanding this or not? It's very hard to gauge that, and they love using their phones. The downside of it is, of course, that that means they're using their phones continuously, and for all they you know, they're texting their mother. Um, but my feeling is we're up against that anyway. So why not just get into it? And I think it's quite good discipline. We have to be more interesting teachers. Okay, the main thing I want to talk about was the blog, because this was, to my eyes, the biggest surprise of the course. So um, I have uh, on the... Well, let me show you the class blog. My philosophy at the beginning was, Chris persuaded me and colleagues that it would be interesting to have a blog because that was kind of what students like to do. And I hate marking essays with a vengeance and don't think it's a terribly useful learning experience and all of that. So I thought this would be kind of cool and the students would kind of like it and it would be kind of fun. And it, all of that was true. Uh, the thing I hadn't expected was it would solve one of the biggest problems in my course. So one of my course objectives is to show the students, remember these are philosophers, economists, business people, playwrights, photographers. One of the biggest things was to show them that science mattered to their life, their daily lives, and to the major decisions that were going to affect them this century. Now, what a photographer thinks is important in, in his or her life and what an economist thinks is very, very different. So my examples were picked because I find them sort of interesting. I thought most students would find them interesting. But the primary challenge is to show people with very disparate backgrounds, very, very disparate interests in life, that they actually do find science interesting and that it's important. And you can't do that by just picking case studies in class. So what I did was to force them to blog, and it had the absolutely fantastic merit that they then started teaching each other, and they started forming little groups within the class who were interested in certain sorts of things. Sorry, that's the wrong one. So, oh, that's perhaps not a best example. <laughs> this was the very last entry on the blog, and they had, there were several students that had done a, because I, to get them used to the system at the start, I had worn a particularly pink shirt at the beginning to get them to text in about whether they liked my shirt or not. And that meant a couple of the enterprising students spent the semester scoring what kind of shirt I had. And at the end, they posted a blog saying that my shirt choice was unpredictable. And I put this to my research group, asking them whether it was unpredictable. And this big blog here is the research effort of my group, proving with great statistical certainty that I am more uh, predictable than I'd like to think. So, 
Um, I actually might have just turned a whole bunch of the students off there because it was kind of fun up until the point where my research group got going and then it was all probability theory and all, <laughs> all manner of stuff. But let me show you what actually happened. So this is a, just a little bit of the course. Um, this is the September part. So here's an entry which somebody else is following up previously what they said on the Phoenix mission um, to Mars. And here's an entry about uh, whether we can go into space on vacation. This one uh, was really good from my point of view. This happened just after we had Barry Marshall in. And one of the students had seen on a TV program, you, some of you probably recognize the TV program, um, that uh, so Barry Marshall showed that bacteria cause ulcers. And everybody says that if you, you know, don't stop stressing yourself, you get an ulcer. And Barry Marshall showed that that's nonsense. And he got a Nobel Prize for it. And all medical therapies now accept that bacteria cause ulcers, not stress. Nonetheless, this person is blogging and saying, how come on last night's television, it said in the program, the TV program, that thing that I've always paid attention to as being a great source of information, that thing said to me that stress causes ulcers. And she's blogged, she blogged about this. And then, in quite some length, and then I think this is the entry where several of the others then got into commenting about it, which said, yeah, I noticed that too, it's kind of weird. So then they've got in on the, you don't need to worry too much about the details, but they're responding to what's going on there and what's happening and giving some examples. So without any problems there, I've now managed to, dem and no effort on my part, I've now managed to demonstrate that the science is not actually transmitting itself that straightforwardly through to popular media. So one should be careful. Um, and, you know, there's more to this than just the superficial media stuff. Okay, so that goes on and on. This one is a very interesting entry, which you don't have to read, but I talked about whether random things were, had elements of predictability. So I did some superficial stuff on Poisson theory, which is easy to do in the abstract. And then, much to my surprise, somebody's actually blogging about a statistician who invented all or discovered all this stuff uh, in the, uh, whenever it was, last century, uh, two centuries ago. There's a lot of stuff on health. The students are very, very hung up on their health, and which I do find ironic working on third world diseases. The healthiest people in the world are very hung up on their health. <laughs> this is um, an example. So uh, Suzanne has been, got very interested in a recent report that gargling with salt water will help with the colds and flu type things, and it's happening at the time. So she's talking about the data on that, and then there are comments posted on this as to whether the data are any good or whether it's an old wives' tale and so forth. So she's responding to a recent media one. It used to rain a lot during my class sessions. They'd always come in drenched. Okay, here's the first um, discovery of the first possibly habitable planet. Did you know that the first planet in another solar system was discovered at Penn State? First one that stood the test of time. Which we now, there's now 500, but Penn State discovered the first one. I didn't know that, and that, the students love that fact. You know, they are at one of the world's leading science universities, and they didn't know. Um, quite a bit on planets, okay, um, Martians. Uh, I did sessions on vaccines in danger. The students are getting, especially the cervical cancer vaccine, they're getting recommended that if they haven't already had it, the women. Actually, the men too, but I polled the class using poll everywhere. Three quarters of the women had had the cervical cancer vaccine and none of the men. <laughs> um, okay, so then there's some stuff which is sort of a bit mixed and things. This is a, uh, what I would call a very good entry. Um, so she's got a nice picture. She's talking about um, coyotes and foxes, and she's got links into news stories about these, and a very nice little essay she's written there. And then it, and it generated some very uh, interesting comments from several people, um, including comments which Carolyn's picked up on and done a bit more on, and then these guys are saying, you know, there's another link and so forth. Now, not everybody in the class cares about coyotes or wolves. In fact, there's four people. But those four people were able to groove over coyotes and wolves. And from my point of view, I wouldn't have known anybody cared about coyotes or wolves. wouldn't have guessed that was a topic of any interest. But they taught themselves this and got into it. And so it goes on and on all uh, semester, this sort of thing. Absolutely variable performance, but um, from my point of view, just absolutely excellent about you know, what sort of things they find interesting. So this one is about what drugs are in the rainforest, and it's actually quite a good piece, but no other students commented on it. So there's no, there was no other interest in that. Um, but then there's other ones which just go crazy, where people really go nuts. And the most 
uh, commented on comment, this is about life on Mars, and I then said, what would it mean if we did find life somewhere else on the planet, uh, in the universe? What would that actually mean? To me, it's an extraordinarily interesting question philosophically. One of the big things that that hinges on is whether the life that we find out there is exactly the same as the life here, so DNA-based, uh, all that sort of stuff, or whether it's completely radically different. And I think the philosophical, religious implications of those two outcomes are extraordinarily interesting. So I posted that saying it's extraordinarily interesting. A bunch, more, a bunch of students have then commented on it. So that's my, a little bit of effort on my part to move that debate along. And I did that from time to time, but by and large didn't need to worry too much. Um, I talked about why there's no proper science in any movies. That's a really interesting question. There's good movies about lawyers, doctors, uh, politicians, scumbags, but there aren't any good movies about scientists. There are science fiction wackos, but there isn't any actual movie of a proper scientific process leading to proper discovery. Even though it's a business which is riven with personal drama, failure, bitchiness, infighting, all the stuff that makes great movies. So very, we, we are missing, we are absent from the popular culture. So if somebody can prove me wrong, that would be great. And so it goes on, and we had quite a bit of discussion about whether um, obesity is actually something you catch from a virus, which is a theory by some people. And that led to very interesting discussions in class about what constitutes evidence for an obesity virus cause and what would it mean. You know, if you catch it off the person next to you, that would be very interesting, right? And so on. So I don't want to um, belabor that point too much. So I thought that that meant that one of my course objectives, perhaps the key course objective, objective got taught to the students by themselves with a bit of effort on Chris's part to set the blog up. Absolutely stunning triumph, I thought, from that perspective. Okay, so what are the issues on the blogging? Well, we actually agonised a lot about whether the students would want to have their names out there like that and whether there'd be problems with them being able to see each other. That was all just hooey. Uh, didn't matter at all. Um, there's serious and significant issues with the software technology at the moment for finding other blogs. So the tag cloud, um, which you let the students tag things, it just spins out of control. So you, it's very hard to, you know, broadly speaking, everything gets tagged differently. And so it's very difficult to find your way around there. That needs some curation. And I did that a lot to start with, but I just broke down. I couldn't keep it up. Um, so that's an issue. And the search engine on the blog software is, is worse than useless. So I can only really find my way around here by um, showing, you know, because I know this website, because I love it. <laughs> um, and then you can, the, the key page that Chris built, which I thought was uh, turned into being absolutely critical, was this contributions page, which allows you to track what's going on on the blog. Because you think of it, if people are blogging, you know, the whole class is 70 students this year, we hope for more than 100 next year. If they're doing one entry a week, as they're supposed to do for the assessment, then that's a lot of entries. It gets very big. So this is a way of arranging things. The blog itself runs by entry. The comments, though, you can't track comments in time. You want to know who wrote something last night. So Chris has got this thing which is organized in time so you can see what happened in the last you know, whatever time. So that's, that's organizing all of the entries um, by time. And that was, for me, the page which was most useful because obviously I had to keep looking at it to make sure there wasn't anything bad or unpleasant going up. So that was, to me, the most interesting page or a useful page. And this one is the one sought by students is the one that I used extensively for the marking. And so uh, this student here, for example, Browdy, um, so I had three marking periods. He did a reasonable job of blogging in the first period, did nothing, one blog in the second one, nothing in the third, and he did a little bit of commenting uh, in those periods and basically pulled out of the class as things went on. And then Alexandra was kind of the opposite. She just went nuts. and. Um, I, you know, I did come to love her, um, but she was, you know, look at her, she couldn't stop herself. <laughs> <laughs> she was the one that actually, so there were several things I worried about, people putting stuff up which was inappropriate. She was the one that walked closest up to some sexually dangerous stuff. So she was very, very fascinated in some areas of science which didn't seem to me to be necessarily entirely appropriate for the blog. <laughs> um, but I, the only line I drew, I needed to draw, was on some of the stuff on cannabis, which I did think some students didn't necessarily want to know, have their 18-year-old views on the web forever. And some of them pulled their comments after I made that comment. Otherwise, there wasn't anything, anything there or very there. Um, before I throw it over to discussion, I just want to make one other observation. Uh, so there were some students that... Uh, so the, the blog aspect of it was worth 40% of the final mark. Um, and that was intentionally high to make sure they did it. 
And there, was, there were some students who would have scored higher had they done more blogging. So in the 70, there were 10 students of that sort um, whose mark was dragged down by their blogging performance, which was almost always to do with n not doing enough. Um, so I worried about those 10 students and whether or not we, we are disempowering students by going down this route. And you can imagine several ways that could happen. For example, uh, uh, somebody whose uh, um, English is not their first language might feel embarrassed to post stuff where everybody else can see it, and it's not anonymous. Um, that turned out not to be an issue. Uh, a couple of the journalists said to me at the start, oh, this is fantastic, I'm really looking forward to writing, and they actually got writer's block. And their <laughs> argument was that if they're going to... I know, you would think you have to choose another career, wouldn't you? Um, but their argument was, if we're going to be journalists, people are going to scour the web for our work when we apply for jobs, so what I post has got to be good. Now, obviously, from my point of view, that's tremendous. Nobody should be posting junk. But from their point of view, they got into writer's block. So I, after the course was over, I, I emailed these, seven, these 10 of 70 students whose mark was lowered by their blog performance to ask why they did so little blogging. And only three of them responded, so I assume that means the other seven were lazy across the board. They couldn't even be bothered <laughs> responding to my email. Um, and one of them put their hand up to being lazy. Uh, and then one of the others said, uh, actually, he was a bit worried about it, um, and then gave me a bunch of reasons why he was a bit worried about it to do with, um, it has to be really good if it's on the web, whereas I can hand you in a half-assed essay. <laughs> Which I thought was really good, and it's not such a bad problem. And the third one was one of those journalists. So there is an issue there, I think, about whether or not this is empowering or disempowering. Some of the others really loved it. Um, the majority of students really loved it. And the reason they really loved it was they could blog on anything they wanted, so long as it was loosely connected to the course objectives. Um, and so that meant if you were interested in cats, and I, best will in the world, I'm not going to do a class session on cats. And several of the students loved cats or horses and did a lot of stuff on that. The most popular blog entry was one on the safety of organic cosmetics. They got 15 comments trading data on the safety of stuff that half the class puts on their, well, I don't know, half some substantial proportion of the class put on their face. Uh, and the, the, that would, I would never have to tackled that topic, I can tell you. <laughs> so um, that was the sort of thing the students did, and that kind of meant that here I am as a, you know, obviously a youngish guy, but not as young as them, uh, and I'm a geek, right? I'm a scientist, trained, highly trained precision thinker who doesn't even know that television program. How do you connect to the 18-year-old? Well, you let them do it themselves. It's quite remarkable to me. What we're going to do next year, um, so the aim of this course is to grow it as big as we can. So um, if we can you know, get the enthusiasm, we wouldn't mind 400 students. And the way we plan to handle that is to increase the number of people working the blog as TAs. So I said to the class at the beginning of last year, the best people on the blogs I'll employ as TAs next year. So I took the two best bloggers, I offered it to the four highest scoring and two of the highest scorers were final year students leaving the university, so they couldn't do it, and the other two accepted very readily. And they are going to post the odd entry, but mostly do the comments and keep the discussion going, do the um, tag cloud annotation, and keep a good eye out, read it really well, to make sure hey, they can say, hey, Andrew, somebody's just posted that they, their heroin experience wasn't that great. Uh, and there is definitely an element for that sort of stuff to be posted if you're letting them go crazy. Otherwise, I thought it was absolutely tremendous. I have to say the, the support, the tech support, I was very nervous about this because uh, I now get into a lecture theatre, I open up 15 windows of different things and it's just a nightmare from the point of view of being calm at the beginning of a lecture. But the tech support was fantastic. We're still doing a little bit of tweaking to the website. We'd like to have some photos available so the students' posts could actually be um, photos next to them and then I could see who they were, which would be, it's a bit weird to have uh, entries that you just can't trace them back. You get to know and love these students by their names, but it would be really nice to have a little photo here, for example, so you can, they, which they could voluntarily upload. Uh, so we're doing those sort of tweaks, but I have to say I thought this worked, worked really well, and I thought based on this sort of session this morning, the first session, that this is a really interesting way to go experimentally. What else can we do with this? How else can we make this sort of talk, groups within groups start to run, really move things along? And I'm going to force, using the, the fact that I can you know, set the grade book, I'm going to force them to do more commenting than I forced them to do last time really get stuck in on that. Because once they get going, actually, you don't need to force them anymore. In fact, I found with my part of the blog, so I have an instructor blog where I talked 
about things that were on my mind and I'd give them feedback, but also stuff that was working in the class or not working in the class. Um, so, you know, here's the final grade distribution, that's how I did it and um, what the results of the various class tests, but also, you know, my concerns about how the class was going. Sometimes they responded, sometimes they didn't. And I found that actually very, very good self-discipline. You know, you form a half-assed view yourself at the end of the day, you're tired. If you're putting it on a blog, you've really got to think, is it correct? You know, my reputation's on the line here too. Is, am I really right in saying that half the class is stupid? Or is it more likely that I didn't explain today's session very well? Okay, perhaps I'll just throw it open to questions now. What are, anybody got any thoughts here? I'm happy to talk about, for example, the marking side of things or any of the... How did you grade it? So Chris Long in philosophy uses a uh, blog, a much more class-directed blog. He has readings each week and they have to blog on that and then somebody is assigned to write a blog of the week um, are summarising the class interactions. And because it's philosophy, they're dealing with very specific questions, and so they bang backwards and forwards on the blog. But he, in the process of that, and he also has a tiny class. Uh, in the process of that, he has a, a rubric which um, has, for example, entries like frequency of participation, and you define that uh, once a month is too low, uh, more than once a week would be an A on participation. And then you have that same thing for the comments, and then there are questions like, does the... the um, uh, uh, entry, for example, does it is it eye-catching? Does it start off in an interesting way which grabs your attention? Another entry is, um, does it make use of other links? Does it pull together different sources? So that means that the algorithm generates, for example, somebody just copies and pastes an entry from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They don't get very good grade for that. So he has these lines, and I just more or less use that table, and you, when you're marking it, you just you know, sort of go down circling it, and through that contributions page, you can see in a hurry what the student has done, so, you know, it's very quick to, um, to say, well, that student has done not enough this month. And so you can see very, you know, the data are just there or, or straight away. So you can just see here that um, Browley has not done enough without actually having to read anything. So you get a long way just like that. And then I would, in this student who's, you know, done pretty well, like, well, moderately well, um, you know, leap to those, have a quick look at them, skim them to see that they're not a copy-paste job. Mm -hmm. If they're making use of other hot links, perhaps they've got a video in there. The first marking period, uh, it took me about 12 hours to mark the class of 70, and I did it on my own, mm -hmm. intending to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the second marking period, which almost all of the same students took and did the same effort on, took me eight hours, because I was much better at it. And I think I could get that down to probably six or even five hours with some more automated feedback. It's the feedback that takes time. Um, the th I took the best of three marking periods, best mark of three marking periods. So the students that had got A pluses by the second marking period dropped out from the blog for the third marking period. And I'm still trying to decide whether that was a good way of arranging it. It meant that the students that hadn't done anything much at the beginning of the course really pulled their fingers out for the third marking period. So actually the third marking period was pretty good, but smaller. The marking I thought was going to be problematic. I found it way easier than, than an essay. Thank you. As instructor, what role did you play uh, in helping uh, the participating students uh, in shaping their use of scientific argumentation? So that was kind of what was happening in the class the rest of the time. So I'd be saying, taking, well, that prayer example, another one was, why do we think smoking is bad for us? None of the students knew, they'd just been told, so they accept it's bad. It's quite amazing, actually. Um, they don't care, just by way of tangent, they don't care whether passive smoking is bad for them. They know it is. Okay, actually, the data on passive smoking are very poor. And the, some of the best uh, evidence that passive smoking is dangerous might actually come from those states where it's been stopped in public places. So the intervention is going to generate the best data on whether it's dangerous or not. We did the intervention long before we had anything to hand on passive smoking. Very, very good data that smoking yourself is dangerous. Um, it's a, commu a community-wide um, belief that passive smoking is bad. The anti-smoking crowd struggle to find data that's compelling to a scientist. Anyway, that was by way of sight. I went through the smoking example going from how was it in the 1920s that doctors recommended smoking and the Red Cross gave out cigarettes to soldiers? How did that move to by the 1970s or certainly the 1980s that the Surgeon General was saying smoking was bad for us and we should try not to smoke. Um, and so that was a question of the developing evidence. And actually at the same time we were inventing how to do that sort of science. And then of course you've got the great 
bit of the tobacco companies arguing against the flaky science. So there's very practical issues at every time. Now, I can do all that as a narrative. Um, what I hope that they will get from the end of that is there are certain sorts of experiments which nail it down. There are very large-scale clinical trials which nail it down. The retrospective analyses are tough. That sort of thing. So I'm talking about the nature of evidence throughout all of that. And some of that crept into some of this. So mostly the students are very strong believers in anecdotes, particularly ones from their mothers. And, and I truly find it alarming. Because they heard it from their mum, it must be true. And no offence to mothers, but honestly, we, are, we, we need to rise above the anecdote as evidence. And so a lot of what I was talking about was that sort of approach. And you'd see this, and some student would say, yeah, but just because Jenny McCarthy's uh, child might have acquired autism from a vaccine doesn't mean that the vaccines are dangerous. So we got into that sort of discussion. Uh, I have to say, I didn't feel at the end of the 37 hours, you're trying to overturn what took humanity thousands of years to come to grips with. Um, it's tough going. But at least in a, major a minority of them, I would say they think about the world more soundly than they did before they started the course. And I think the majority of them realise that science can be interesting. And they really hated it at school. That's why they're not science majors. And I think the majority of them got the hang of it. It's, there is always some bit they should find interesting. Just say curiosity, we do a lot of blogs for I am and uh, one thing we struggle with, especially with freshmen, is their ability to communicate with the English language, even if it's their native language. And uh, I was wondering if you had any yeah. problem with that or you had to address that or anything like that. So I moved here um, three years ago from Scotland and I'd been teaching final year students at Scotland in, in Edinburgh. And, uh, you know, internationally American education gets a very bad press and I worried immensely about a bunch of Frenchmen, freshmen I was expecting to use paragraphs and capital letters in the right places and periods. And, and there were some students who really couldn't string a sentence together, but they were a tiny minority. Really, I was actually completely blown away by the eloquence of some of these students, uh, the majority of them. And uh, I suspect uh, probably this, the, I only lost a few students. I suspect probably the ones that are struggling to string a sentence together probably drop out of the class pretty fast because it's, you, know, you can't hide, it's on the web. Your mother can see it. So. Um, I, I don't know. I, I had 40 students to start with on, on enrolment day. I got 70 by the end of two weeks. So by me showing them how brutal it was going to be and the fun problems and talking about whether their boyfriends were poisoning them and stuff, I got it up to 70 and then it settled back down again by about five. So I'd say we lost that five through that sort of issue. And so as someone who's taught stars for studs for a number of years, uh -huh. astronomy one, I really appreciate this approach too because I, I often thought, you know, what's the purpose of our general education requirements? And it's really not to teach, them, but not for people to become professional astronomers, which many of my colleagues thought, but to to really understand science and understand the way yeah. it's done. And this is great. I mean, this I great stuff. so I haven't done too much exploration of what else is on, on offer on campus, but I have very strongly come to the view that we are, when we do gen ed science courses, we should not be teaching them as dumbed down scientists. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. And it's that that's put them off science at school. It's that that puts them off science at university. It's just completely wrong. So there is an astronomy for scientists, and you should teach that to scientists. But there's an astronomy for regular people, and we should be teaching that stuff. Um, you know, non-geeky, mildly interested, slightly amazed by what's going on up there. And when the dean came in and um, did his session, it was just, I mean, he painted in an hour, he did the whole of astronomy, several thousand years of astronomical thought in an hour with some incredible slides. I mean, it was just gobsmacking. I, the, you know, I ne I, after that one hour with the dean, I do not look at the heavens the same way. Me personally, it had a big impact on me. <laughs> did you know the astronomers know almost nothing? <laughs> so, so in biology, we, we're learning more and more about the biological world. That's what I do day to day. What's happened with the astronomers is that they, they maximised about 1960, 70, somewhere there, and now they're losing information. They can explain 4% of the universe. <laughs> they're, going, they're rowing backwards, man. Are they rowing backwards? So is your blog open? Yes, it's completely open now. Um, the, the links, that is a little bit of an issue with the, the links are all a bit nasty. You can blog my research, um, you can Google my research page, which is just the read group, and that on there I've got a teaching page which has the links to all this. I mean, it's really nice that it's still sitting there, and it'll be sitting there for next year. It's really good to show the dean that I was doing something and all that too. <laughs> How did it change what you taught? Or what you part? Um, so I bounced off it a lot. 
um, I used it a lot as a hook. I'd start off in this class with the blog, and somebody, look, somebody's just said this this week, and either I really liked it, so I'd say, this is a great blog entry. I didn't know that about Cozies and Wolves. Or I'd say, look, there's somebody's just said here that uh, Jenny McCarthy's um, child has autism, therefore vaccines aren't safe. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to do this as a class later on, but you know, this is one case. And let's have a look at this, and then I'd beam up the Jenny McCarthy videos and talk it through with the class. So I knew that at least one person out there cared about that topic. Mm -hmm. So I used a lot, a lot like that. Um, the other thing was that when I was talking, for instance, about the nature of evidence in the smoking, when they were blogging about something else, I don't know, the safety of organic cosmetics, um, I would say, but is that evidence better or worse than it is for smoking? So I'd use it as a comparative way of looking at it. So I found it really good. And I think you could actually run a fair bit of the class, if you're happy to do it on the trot, just off the blog. So by the time the blog's got moving enough, there's enough material on here that you can go back over, choose your examples. It's, it's very rich. And I did actually ask the students, so I had elaborate polls, for what would you like to do in the course? What questions would you like me to choose? You know, do you care about nanotechnology? Or would you like to know something about, well, our mates toxic? Um, the students hardly had any capacity to choose a question themselves like that. It was quite amazing. They've got almost no votes. And the most popular question was, which they came up with, was, is athletic ability heritable as a run of families? To which the answer is yes, let's move on. I mean, there's nothing teachable. There's no teaching moment in that. It's, I mean, didn't you look around? Um, so actually offering them choice like that didn't work. Doing it this way was really interesting. The other thing that was good about this is they reacted a lot to my class. So there was a bunch after the prayer session. There's a whole bunch of stuff with people and views on the prayer. The vaccine debate, before my classes, the vaccine discussion was verging on a name. After my classes, it was interesting. Not always correct, but very interesting. And, uh, do you see parallels between semesters? I mean, are some topics perennial? So I, I have, we didn't run it this semester. No, I'm going to run it again for the second time in fall. Uh, I do look forward to seeing whether that's the case. And I'd also, once I, so this was very good for teaching me the mind of an 18-year-old American, yeah. <laughs> which, um, you know, I, I've never been one, and all the ones I know are the children of scientists, so that, <laughs> so getting on the popular wavelength was pretty tough going, and this taught me a lot about that, so I'll get better. I just wanted to comment also, I find that non-majors are much better writers than I Yeah, <laughs> so I guess that's... I guess that was probably part of the answer. It wasn't that I was thinking that the American student couldn't that string a sentence together. I was just basing it on my experience of American science students. So that is one blessing. Yes. Teaching them. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question. I'm a Roxbury Jackson instructor. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I worry about with my students is that they're not aware of what's going on now in the world in science. Mm -hmm. all, for me, there's always yeah. a disaster or a discovery, right. dinosaur discovery, something like that. When you have students choose the topics, do you find that they go back to older topics? Or are they yeah, no, so a lot of them started reading the New York Times, science page in the New York Times. In fact, they were shocked to discover that there was a newspaper called the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> and even, even those who've read it for years were shocked to discover there was a science page. But there was a, the New York Times they were responding to a lot. But, for example, we did a session with Chuck Fisher in biology about the oil spill in the Gulf, which was, he was in, you know, submarines in real time. This is what I took yesterday, and they emailed me this this morning. It's fabulous stuff. Um, Several of the students asked me before Chuck came in to talk, could he begin by explaining what had happened in the Gulf? Because when you're an undergraduate, you're just not in contact with the news. So that there had been a platform that exploded, that was a mystery to some of them. But I did do as much as I could on the news side of things, because for me it's a question of, you know, so a lot of my testing was done on them filtering through the little tiny stories that the snippet they might see on the sidebar of some newspaper. Because I really do think you want to show it's important right now, and it's going to be important forever. Yeah, I certainly am going to use them as teaching examples. So here's a good entry, here's a bad entry. I'm going to do a lot of that. Uh, I thought I'd actually let, see what the students did. Because a telling student could, who's really struggling to think of a science topic could visit last year's blog and have a look and say, oh, cats, I'm allowed to blog on cats. And obviously if they copy and paste, I'll be very unimpressed. But if they do something new on cats, that's fine with me. My worry would then be, of course, we'll end up with a tag cloud almost identical to this year. So we'll see. I, now that I've got a couple of TAs, I figure we can police that. And they're very enthusiastic, my second year TAs. <laughs> professional bloggers, they became. So, yeah, do my course become professional bloggers? So I was a science major in college, and I got a kick out of the fact that there was physics for poets and rock mm. for jocks, but not 
poetry for biologists, which right. I, I wanted to be easier yes. poetry class. So I was, <laughs> held that, I was held that over my other. Yeah. I said, hey, we're smarter than you guys. We, you know, there are easy classes for you. Should, should the first entry level class for a discipline in the sciences be different for majors and non-majors? Yeah, I mean, I'd be right up for more of that sort of thing. I, obviously, as a, non as a scientist, I couldn't actually, I wouldn't know how to do poets for geeks. Um, but I do think that would be a very good sort of thing to think through. Since I've been doing this, I've been meeting all sorts of interesting people. One of the people I've always thought of as a hard-ass biochemist, she does um, bacterial stress pathways, lots of really heavy-duty molecular biology. She teaches um, an early-stage molecular biology course, which I would have thought was just boring beyond belief, uh, the material. She does it in part with somebody in the English department on a section on metaphors. And she brings the students from this metaphor class into the biochemistry class, and the biochemists discuss with the metaphor people what they're actually meaning when they have these diagrams of pathways and things happening and stuff, which have no real physical representation. It's just the way we scientists think. So she's using the English majors to get the biologists to think better about the sort of metaphors we scientists use. And I thought it's just such an excellent idea. Really good. I'm really interested. We should definitely do more thinking like that. We can tackle one more question. Do students raise much about creation from an evolutionary point? Yeah, so, so I am an evolutionary biologist, card-carrying professional, and um, I worried a lot about it. Um, my decision was to steer clear of that uh, on the grounds that I probably couldn't handle it very calmly and all that productively. <laughs> um, but the closest I got to it was that I had already got a long-standing appointment to go, I invited a, a very distinguished speaker to come to Penn State to speak, and it clashed with my class. So I had to get out of the class. So I put on a video by Randy Olson, I don't know if you guys have seen it, uh, called Flock of Dodos, which is about the uh, evolution and creation debate. And he was an evolutionary biologist who went off to, uh, he was an associate professor at one of the universities in, up north, and he went off to Hollywood to make movies. He quit his faculty position and went off. And he made this movie about the debate. And so it's, it's about the debate and the people in it. And the thrust of it is not the debate. He's not doing discussing the evidence, though that comes up a lot. He discusses the mismatch between the way the scientists discuss evolution and creation and the creationists do. And he makes the very powerful point that if you were going to choose to have a beer with some of those people, you'd always choose the creationists. They're the nice people, the smiley people, the happy ones. And there's a bunch of really unpleasant evolutionary biologists who can't believe how completely stupid these other people are. You get very, very angry about it. And I discussed that aspect of it with the class <laughs> because I do think that's actually something they need to realise. Scientists need to realise it too. We're kind of odd and strange people. And that movie gets that across really well. <laughs> Off the back of that, some of them raised the issue with evolution and I asked them if they would like to discuss evolution. And there was about half the class who were up for it and the other half who were so up to there. They just don't want any more. They just don't care. So I thought, well, if half the class feel that vehemently negative, I won't touch it. Thank you very much.